Exactly. Kind of Medical advancements have succeeded, uh, but we've also discovered new ways to institute the death the social penalty. impact. So, I mean, it's it's a mixed bag. I think what what my gut reaction was to thinking of how science has contributed to this kind of socioeconomic benefits in the last 50 years is that it's really hard to tease out the science, the contributions of science in these last 50 years. So I think about students or who go into science what the intentions of science are and I think most people want to do good with their work. I don't think most people go into science to be the villain and to, you know, destroy the world with a laser. Um, and and so, so where I have a really hard time teasing it out is, is it comes down to money and policy and where the funding is for the science and pharmaceuticals and what drugs cost and who has access to them and gene patents, who has access to screening and because once you patent a the gene then you have to use their services and you have to pay for their services. Um, and so I have a really hard time teasing out the science from the policy. So um, uh, to build on what both Pablo and uh, Julie were saying, you know, so basically the way I think about these things is that, and this is basically the core thesis of my book, is that technology amplifies underlying human forces. And so, um, you know, where those human forces are positive, technology tends to help things go in a better direction. Where those human forces are neutral, technology doesn't do much. Where they're negative, technology causes more harm. So exactly. we, on the one hand, we have the internet in which, you know, on the, you know we can keep better uh, touch with our friends and families, but, you know, ISIS is recruiting online. Uh, um, and so I think, you know, the, uh, you know, ultimately, it's, science tends to have a net positive impact on those things that human beings want as a whole, right? And so we all tend to want to get richer. And so there's a general increase, let's say, in the global economy as a result of scientific advancements. On the other hand, we're also really bad at planning and, and, uh, and restraining ourselves from long-term damage. And so I think science is also helping us, you know, fall off the cliff of what might be either resource, you know, depletion or climate change. Yeah. Um, and in <coughs> both cases, you know, it's basically technology is basically amplifying the <coughs> underlying condition. And that, that's the socioeconomic aspect of it. I would say that, uh, you know, science is just a tool that, uh, you know, people use the world over, and we just keep discovering new ways to use this tool. Um, now, like, that's, I constantly argue uh, as to, you know, it's, it's less the fact that we're advancing technology at a rapid rate and more of who has the easier access to this technology. Um, yeah, like we said, no one goes into science to be a supervillain, they just go in there to create and discover. Um, but, you know, there are people out there with uh, completely selfish motives, dangerous motives, violent motives, what have you. Um, who use these new discoveries or who fund these new discoveries. I mean, it's still kind of ridiculous that a lot of our scientific funding from the U.S. government comes through the Defense Department. And uh, it has more to do, in my opinion, in the so social economic aspect of it, as to who controls, I mean, and this is like so classic economic theory, it's like who controls the means of production, actually the one who decides where science and technology goes. And right now, it's, uh, it's in the hands of fools, really. So. Um, in our last panel, you had mentioned an interesting statistic um, that about the, oh, the number yeah. of people with yeah, cell phones. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So accounts. sometime in the last year, the world passed the point where the number of mobile phone accounts in the world exceeds the total human population. <laughs> um, and you know, people used to talk about, oh, you know, digital communication will, you know, uh, unite the world and create one global village where it will be peace, love, and happiness. Um, and we haven't quite seen that. Uh, it's actually very clear in the United States how those advances don't change the underlying socioeconomic situation. So over the last four decades, the rate of poverty in this country has basically stayed flat. It's gone up a little bit since the last recession. Um, uh, social mobility has stagnated. Inequality has skyrocketed. And those are the same last four decades in which we've basically seen a golden age of digital innovation. Right? So if you believe that the innovation in and of itself leads to positive social ends, then you know you can see very easily from statistics that are available to anybody that that's not quite the case. I just wanted to say something about cell phones is kind of in the you know in the last recession, people losing their jobs, people who had very professional jobs, engineers or whoever losing their jobs and then you know, uh, just uh, 
people saying negative things like, well, they still have their cell phone, they still have their iPhone, <laughs> you know. But the thing is that the iPhone is such an important tool for finding a job, for finding the resources you need, like to be able to answer the email and not miss your interview, to be able to look up job ads where, whenever you have a moment. Um, and so I think in some ways that technology has really helped people access the, some resources that they need. That's true, but the flip side of that is it doesn't in any way help you get past the interview if you don't already have the capacity to do it. No, it, it's true. Um, I mean, we already do live in uh, what I like to, I mean, I'm, I'm a techno-optimist sometimes. I mean, we live in what is pretty much can be labeled as like a post-scarcity or near-post-scarcity society. It's just managed by the same people who think that world peace equals, I want to buy the world a Coke. So, I mean, and that's pretty much the problem there. Uh, and, you know, my, my upbringing by socialist parents is coming out. But uh, <laughs> um, it, the thing is that, you know, it, the, the people who fund this technology want to only increase the profit margin of uh, what, what they get back from it. So, you know, there could be more cell phone uh, accounts than, you know, the world could ever possibly imagine. But, you know, how many of these cell phone accounts are probably held in escrow by large corporations to just hand out to their employees? And, you know. Yeah, the, but I would say the problem is even worse than that. It's, um, you know, the distribution of cell phones is certainly not uh, even. You know, there, oh, obviously not. if you're, you know, living on a dollar a day, you're much less likely to have one, although there are plenty of people with phones even then. Um, but the problem is even once the, you close the digital divide and you give everybody a phone, what you can do with that phone is still totally dependent on your education, on who you know, on who is willing to call and you back if you call them. Who actually owns the phone in the long run, which is the corporation that provides the carrier service. Yeah. Right, although even there, like even if you transfer that ownership and co-own the system, it doesn't undo that social economic disparity that Agreed. exists in the in the world to begin with. In fact, um, you know, you could argue that it amplifies it. Right? So, you know, people, you know, it's never been easier for powerful people to call each other up at a whim and ask for favors from each other than it is today. Um, Do you whereas, have Bill Gates' phone number? No. <laughs> right. But, but the thing is, even if he you did, it. he wouldn't call you back. Right. right. He, he turned it off because Trump's been calling him. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, you know. but it, uh, on the work thing, when it comes to the cell phones, you know, not only is it useful for getting to the interview at point, I mean, I used to work entirely through a system that is completely dependent on the cell phone, which mm -hmm. is ride sharing. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, you know, with it completely eliminates uh, the overhead mm -hmm. and the interface with like an actual boss or what have you, and uh, you know, it, it does everything technologically uh, through the cell phone. Um, but at the same time, you know. Without that cell phone, or you know, I'm completely lost as in regards to like a source of income. When I used to work uh, in ride sharing services, right. but um, you know, it, it it begs the question. You know, <laughs> does everyone having access to the fact that you can now make money from just using your cell phone uh, mean that the socioeconomic the, impact the, is yeah, is the gap closing? No, well, it's interesting all. that you bring up uh, ride sharing because that's an area where uh, I think your point about ownership comes back, right? right? So for example, now what's happened is, you know, there's services like Uber, which are basically consolidating ownership of the organizations that manage, that match customers to drivers, right? Mm -hmm. And the more that's consolidated, I mean, these, you know, these entities are basically middlemen, right? And so the more that's consolidated, the more you're concentrating power and more ability to extract uh, profit from customers and take away, you know, um, wages from drivers, and you're putting it into one entity, and that's you know again enabled by the technology, right? So on the one hand, in the short term we're all benefiting, but my guess is in the long term, you know, what we'll see is uh, we'll all increasingly be unhappy by this one, you know, monolithic entity that is charging us very high prices for something that you know used to be much cheaper. It makes it flexible, as opposed to at least before it was. There was kind of there. There have been an equilibrium, and it disrupts the equilibrium. It disrupts the equilibrium. And creates a new one, um, but it's more centralized power. Yep. I mean, going back to this socioeconomic impacts, definitely. Uh, I, I think I think there never actually was an equilibrium. If um, if we look at the history of say uh, our own native superpower, uh, it was built on the fact that there wasn't an equilibrium. In fact, 
um, you know, American history proves that uh, its economy thrived on the backs of slaves and minorities and what have you, um, to the point that, you know, the highest moments of what we remember as being, you know, like America's top points, you know, economically or even in ideas of social cohesiveness were also the points in which, you know, you know, uh, let's say, you know, times when women couldn't vote or, you know, uh, my own skin color mattered more than my character and so on and so forth. Um, so I think, I, th I think this idea of just like there, there used to be an equilibrium is also a fantasy that's produced by the socioeconomic climate to have you further believe that, you know, oh, recessions are happening because the economy is bad. It, it will, it's, recessions are happening and, you know, you know, technological advancement is not being funded solely because, uh, you know, the people in power choose not to fund those things and believe that a recession actually helps their bottom line. A recession is happening mostly because uh, now there isn't, you know, the backs of millions of slaves, really, and, you know, that a percentage of the population aren't the only ones profiting from it. I mean, that percentage of the population that profits the most keeps growing smaller and smaller and smaller, and we keep suffering from it. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's not like uh, escaping from a recession or developing a new iPhone is going to solve all the issues in our world especially since these issues have existed for hundreds of years. Yeah. Um, so one other, one other thing is about the groups that are prepared to take advantage of them is one of the things that's discussed there. And you know, we talked a lot about you know, technology is a tool, so it allows you to leverage, um, and sometimes a very small voice. You know, I mean, if you, ISIS, for example, you know, not a lot of people worldwide, but they can get their message out. Uh, Black Lives Matter on the other on the other end of the spectrum. You know, people who do not necessarily in and of themselves have a large number of people can amplify their voice, get to the people, who, oh, just like advertising, get to the people, their market, and get heard by the people who are, are they can kind of convert over to their way of thinking and, and can kind of seem maybe bigger or more effective than they would without that amplifier. So um, our, our worldwide, like you said, it is are people around the world in a position where they can kind of take advantage of this? Or are we seeing just kind of, like, like what are the successes, I guess is my question. What are the successes worldwide um, the one that occurs to me, and this isn't even really technology based in the sense of like cell phones or anything, was the kid who built a windmill in Africa. You know, and that's kind of, and it's, it's, it's a success story specifically because it's kind of so rare. And he was using old textbooks that were donated because they were, they were no longer used in America, basically. And he was able to build a windmill to like, you know, operate water pumps in his community and all this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, with an access to a cell phone, you could get to basically all that same material as well. So um, what are the success stories where you see someone or so, some society really has, has been able to, to get, get a successful you know, improvement in their situation due to the rise of science or the accessibility of technology or anything like that? Do we have any, any optimism to, to share on that front? Uh, I would say, as a resident, I suppose, techno-optimist here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have, Which has I, been hard to detect so far, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you have to critique the things you love, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, remember, I remember sitting uh, on my grandma's balcony in Puerto Rico, uh, like in, in the mountainous regions of Puerto Rico, and basically seeing an Iranian uprising on my uh, Twitter feed. Uh, the whole uh, Ahmadinejad versus Musavi situation. And uh, it was funny because uh, it, it, it just felt so weird <coughs> to know about it before I even saw it on the TV. And, uh, you know, I, I would be, uh, it, it gave me this sort of like, sort of empowerment in a sense, because, you know, I was able to retweet some things and then people in like, Tehran were just like, oh, thank you, I didn't even know that, I'll stay away from that street. You know, it's, 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 it's surreal. Um, yeah. And it was, it was the moment for me that pretty much like, I was just like, wow, the positive impact of immediate communication is intense. But, uh, you know, uh, 
when, when it comes to success stories and culture, because that was not a success story, again, I'm bringing up like horrible things for some reason, <laughs> but um, uh, in positive impact in culture, I mean, I've seen uh, the rise of rapid communication uh, be able to coordinate, you know, back to this, uh, appropriate like protests to mm -hmm. situations, you know, one of the important things about Black Lives Matter, Matter is that when it's always spelled out, it has a hashtag in front of it. And that's because people are able to communicate where they'll be gathering uh, for, you know, an action, a rally, a disruption, what have you, all over the world. Uh, this also has helped uh, coordinate what, you know, can we, called like grieving marches, you know, after the attacks in Paris, uh, the way people communicated through Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and et cetera, uh, allowed them to help each other grieve, and at the same time, gather together, say, in like their cafes, restaurants, bars, uh, you know, on the streets, and et cetera, uh, to know where to get together with other people who were feeling the same way as they were, uh, providing an appropriate avenue for this sort of thing. Um, I mean, and you know, in Africa, I keep, I keep seeing, uh, you know, and it makes me wonder if this is where the true superheroes are going to pop out and find the science heroes. Uh, you know, random thirteen-year-old kids like, you know, building computers out of like nothing and like, you know, windmills. And uh, there was one recently that like helped completely change the course of like a creek near his village by just, you know, like watching various like documentary TV shows about people changing the course of creeks. And uh, I, just, I just think that's fascinating. The rapid access to information creates great things. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'll play the role of the resident technology skeptic. Because <laughs> personally, I think it's easier. Um, uh, it so is. Um, it is actually really easy to cherry pick stories where somebody appears to have used science or technology in a way that's improved the situation. Uh, but it never happens in a systematic enough way that it actually upends the social order. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I actually, so this is my field of studying how technology impacts global uh, international development. And, and the press is amazingly good at finding these stories where one kid somewhere has done something interesting with the internet or with a radio or with a telephone or with their smartphone. Um, but what they don't emphasize is that you know, not much actually changes for them after that story. Or, or this is not a story that can easily be replicated in a, ma on a, in a large scale, simply because if everybody were doing it, something else would happen that would cause uh, them to fall back in their current situation. So for example, you mentioned the Iran and Twitter protests. Well, what happened after that? They were crushed. They were crushed, yeah, they were exactly. Crushed. So, so, you know, great. We tweeted about uh, protests, we got crushed, right? It wasn't, it wasn't good enough to cause a positive outcome. Um, we often talk about the Facebook revolution in the a Arab Spring, but you know all of those countries are still having a very difficult time uh, building anything resembling a democracy, and that's because those social changes require a lot more than the technology to uh, actually implement. Um, Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think is uh, uh, that I you know I started looking at in the history of technology is whether any technology ever has actually caused the world's least um, powerful people to end up with powers like the most privileged people in that era. And it's never actually once ever happened. Um, um. There are situations where, you know, some apparent technology appears to share, you know, power a little bit more evenly, but even then what you find is that there is a deliberate social attempt on somebody's part mm -hmm. to cause that technology to be used in the way that makes sense. And the most, you know, the, the most obvious example of that is print. Uh, where you know previously scholarship was you know in medieval era scholarship was a you know was extremely elite activity basically largely kept in monasteries and some um, you know uh, monarchic courts and you know these days everybody can read but that required in addition to the invention of this technology of the printing press the fact that somebody somewhere was willing to educate everybody to be able to, to read and so we still see those disparities in countries that are not willing to. Well, and that you had the standardized alphabets. It was yeah. different, like like universities would, would write. Sure, sure, absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things that went along with that. I mean, it, it's funny. Um, I I always used to joke that the two main uh, like social like uh, scientific uh, advancements or technological advancements that have led to the most social change in the world, as in like people being able to have their own, I suppose their own agency and their own will uh, to bring about actual change 
uh, have also been turned against them, sure. which is the guillotine and the AK-47. And so, you know, when we think of both, both things, we think of revolution, but in reality, it's almost like a marketed revolution of sorts. Right. And, that, and that's, that's what it is. Uh, market forces and the people in control of them conspire pretty much directly to make sure that these things do not accept, uh, upset the status quo, right. because the status quo for them is profitable. If these things truly, if technology actually were creating social change nowadays, which it should, and you know, people should take it into their own hands to try to use their technology to create social change, uh, but if it truly did nowadays, uh, you know, we'd be living in a completely different world. And you know, I would be, you know, exploring galaxies right now probably. But like, uh, but that's not the case. What instead we're seeing is, you know, uh, revolutions being crushed by the same technological forces that uh, helped start them. Um, we are seeing, you know, uh, people who are in control of what is supposedly advanced water supplies poisoning them. Right. You know, we are seeing people that. Uh, choose to mismanage the funds that lead to scientific research. We see people cutting, you know, uh, you know, things like, oh, imagine like a Mars colony might actually, you know, be some sort of like social future for us. Uh, but we also see like cuts in NASA by the people in charge and, you know, people who outright deny that like the world is heating and cooling in a, in a variety of like scientifically proven ways. You know, it's... <clears throat> The socioeconomic impact of science is directly the fact that there's too much socioeconomic involved <laughs> in science. Uh, but it's the sad fact that in today's society, and in society all throughout history, without our rich patrons, <laughs> we have been completely unable to advance you know, technology and science. It's just finding a way to escape that patronage system that is becoming ever so difficult and elusive. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> Um, Would you like I, to cherry pick a success story? <laughs> well, I, 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 want to, I, I do not want to cherry pick a success okay. story, but I do want to contribute something that, that shifts the conversation a little away from technology um, and looking at like the global food crisis, which is not an issue of quantity of food. Like, so the estimates is that we'll be at 10 billion by 2050 years. And so how are you going to feed all these people? And it's not an issue of quantity of food. So you have food scientists trying to come in to try to figure out how to make more food, and it's not an issue of quantity, it's access. It's a socioeconomic question. Um, and so that's been a lot of what I've been doing with my edible insects work is that, one, if, if it's a sustainable protein in, you know, in regards to stripping our environmental resources, what the cows are doing and everything, like, it takes so much less to produce the same amount of protein from something like crickets. So there's a couple of factors that feed into this if you're trying to feed the world. And one is normalizing it somewhere like here, because if you're going here, like this would help you in whatever country, and but I won't eat them. You know, they're, that's not going to work. But um, but but less than that, what it, what's important is, and what what a really to me a benefit of edible insects is, is that is the possibility to cheaply farm them yourself in your home, and so you can get the same kind of protein that you would get from cattle, but you can't farm cattle because your fields won't support them where you don't have the land access. But you can have uh, Rubbermaid bins and some netting and some cheap food, and you can get that much protein for yourself in your home. And so that's where the benefit is. So it's kind of like this teach a man to fish sort of thing, like get the technology to the point where people can afford it and do it in their homes, and then they can actually feed themselves. I, mean, I like I like that you're saying this. With, you know, it's not that insects aren't quite a technology, but they're a form of science being used. To. Exactly. Uh, on the other hand, you, I imagine that you ran smack dab into the resistance from strongly embedded human culture that finds it disgusting. Right. <laughs> right. But, but it's also it's also which it's also which human culture because exactly. it's, also, it's a Western yeah, issue. Yeah, exactly. The lens of which we're viewing this right now is you know I'd rather prefer. Uh, you know, steak and cauliflower to like, you know, a cricket, but at the same time, you know, I have been in cultures where, you know, chocolate covered crickets are totally a thing, and, you know, fried crickets, uh, you know, boiled crickets, what right. have you, and like, it, 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 you know, it may seem surreal to us, or even, uh, you know, oppressive in a way to be like, oh, you can't have access to our food, eat the crickets, uh, but at the same time, you know, 
being able, you know, like, like you said, being able to have control of your own food supply. I mean, the hand that feeds you can also kill you. And you being able to have act, uh, control of your own food is it's in itself a scientific advancement in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, because, um, you know, we are so trained to believe that, uh, you know, oh, the hunter-gatherer days or the farming days are over. We city dwellers, you know, have won and our supermarkets will, like, rule the landscape. But, you know, in reality, there's still the farmers out there. Uh, who provide that food for you? And there's this and big, starving. there's yeah, exactly. And there's this big boom, especially in like this whole idea of like homesteading or urban homesteading or whatever. Right? I live in Austin, where like every second hipster has like a chicken or something. And uh, you know, but but the advantage of that is instead of going to the supermarket and paying so much for those eggs, I'm not able to barter with my neighbor. Instead, on a level, well, socioeconomic level that I'm able to afford. Uh, for those eggs and give them something in value return. It's, it's a development of mutual aid uh, through uh, the advancement of science and our ability to control our own food supply. Yeah. Um, yes? Just thinking food supply, you know, there was a sociological advantage, socioeconomic advantage, say when we went to uh, iron tools. I mean, I've lived places where they're still plowing with wood. But, so that changed the whole culture from hunter-gatherers to farmers. Now we've got another one, uh, same thing in agriculture with the, the large farming equipment and stuff. So a family farm can't really afford that. Most of our food is coming from corporate farming and that, and again, this is socioeconomic. It has changed the society from small town family farms to more urban dwellers. So that has definitely changed the society. You know, who's to say what's better? <coughs> okay, going back to the barter system is really a de well, it, it, evolution of what they've developed. Now, is it gonna? Is the technology gonna be better for us? Because with the monocropping and the pesticides, insecticides, etc. Um, is that going to be more of an issue where the socioeconomic change is actually going to start thinning out the herd, as it were, because of, you know, if there is a disaster with the monocropping, there will be a major famine. Uh, we know the chemicals are causing, are causing problems, you know, the bee die off and the uh, things that are really necessary. Um, could it send us back into a dark age? I mean, there's there's always that possibility of like technological and scientific crash because we're being managed by idiots. But uh, the uh, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, what you just brought up made me think also about how the industrial revolution. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, victors always are able to tell history through their own lens. Um, when we say the term Luddite, we think of some fool who doesn't know how to use technology or doesn't want to, uh, when in fact the Luddites were a social resistance movement uh, against the sudden uh, monopolization of control over the food supply, uh, the means of production of various goods and products and services. Textile. Yeah, well, they smashed the looms. I mean, like they, yeah, they smashed yeah. the looms. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they straight up smashed the looms, yeah. and like and you know, in some cases, they even burned cash. village yeah. farms. Well, because uh, they didn't want the the socio sociological exactly. change, but it was going to happen. Absolutely, and it's just it's just that uh, socioeconomic forces, especially uh, mercantilist capitalist forces, uh, are very much against the competition. And so to even allow the competition to, you know, die off naturally is a risk of sort of said, you know, a lot of, you know, of the big bosses and owners do not want to take, you know, they could have easily been like, well, this industrial revolution is going to quickly, you know, make these things die out. Let's, let's not even bother with them, et cetera. But they saw a threat in people uh, having closer control of their own means of production, uh, you know, of having their own looms, of being able to, as a you know, as a village, grow their own food. And we have stuff. something very oh, similar Lord. going on right now with uh, farming. My father owns a seed sorter, mm -hmm. ah. 
He cannot rent his seed sorter to any farmers, but he allows any farmer to use it. Monsanto comes every year. Men in dark cars with suits who are very scary and come and threaten him. And he's 89 and he makes a rude gesture and tells him to get off his property. <laughs> but he has to literally, the farmers, if they use his seed sorter, they have to hide it. They have to hide it in a barn because he used to have two of them and one of them was destroyed by accident. Yeah, they don't know. Some vandals found it out in the back of someone's pocket.